To the south of Jordan, in the high plateau of the desert, south of the Dead Sea, through the treacherous mountains and the winding and twisted gaps between the steep rocky slopes, hid a beautiful and mystic mountain city. It was named the Lost Ancient City. This city with a size of about 10 kilometers is now in total ruins, but its very existence is a compelling testimony to the world, telling a tale that bears great significance to the destiny of mankind. Brothers and sisters, peace, peace to you all. I am Pastor Zhang. I am Sister Joanne. Sister Joanne, do you know the city where we just saw the relics was called Petra? It was actually the capital of the nation of Edom over 3,000 years ago. The nation of Edom? Wasn't Esau their founding father? I know he and one of the forefathers of Israel, Jacob, were twins. How did Esau ever end up in this part of the mountains? It all began with the turmoil caused by a bowl of lentil stew. The turmoil caused by a bowl of lentil stew? Chapter 25 of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, tells us that Esau and Jacob were a pair of twins. They jostled against each other even when they were in their mother's womb. When the time of delivery came, the first to be born was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. Therefore his father, Isaac, named him Esau, which meant hairy. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob, meaning grasping. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah, their mother, loved Jacob. One day Jacob was cooking some lentil stew. Esau came in from the open country famished, so he asked Jacob for some of his stew. Jacob seized the opportunity and asked Esau to trade his firstborn's birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. Esau could not resist his hunger. He swore an oath and gave away his birthright to Jacob. Pastor Jean, According to Jewish laws, the eldest son not only would succeed as master of the house, but also receive a double portion of the inheritance. To trade one's birthright for some food is treating that birthright too lightly, to say the least. Indeed. Esau later regretted what he did, but it was too late. Continuing on in Genesis 27, when Isaac was getting old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he knew that his days were numbered. He called in Esau and asked him to prepare a meal made from wild game. He promised to bless Esau after the meal. Rebekah overheard this. Because Rebekah loved Jacob, she persuaded Jacob to trick his father Isaac into giving him the blessing of the firstborn instead. As a result, Esau was angry with Jacob and wanted to kill him. Jacob had to run away. Even though Genesis 32 through 33 tells us there was reconciliation between the two brothers, they had never gotten over that enmity as their households grew larger and stronger. They could not coexist peacefully in Palestine. Over 3,000 years ago, Esau and his people gradually migrated southward to the land of Seir. His people began mixing with the local people and culture to become the nation of Edom, which was situated in the south of today's Jordan. Jacob stayed behind in Palestine and became one of the forefathers of Israel. 
Actually, the fact that the descendants of Jacob were able to remain in Canaan was due to his father Isaac's blessing. Since the two brothers live so far apart, they should not have had any more conflicts? But things are never that simple. Later, when Moses was bringing the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, they were trying to go to the promised land through Edom. But their request was rejected. As a result, over a million Israelites, with their young and old, had to go around Edom and travel through the desert instead. And that was only the beginning of the feud between the two households. The Edomites continued to give trouble to the Israelites. They even ganged up with other Gentile nations to oppress God's people. So at the height of its prosperity in Edom's history, God sent a prophet to speak against them and warn them of the impending judgment. The prophecy is what we are studying now in the book of Obadiah. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. Only one chapter with 21 verses. What is the importance of so short a book? Besides, it is only a prophecy about the ancient kingdom of Edom. How can that relate to us? Good questions. On the surface, this prophecy seems to bear no relationship to us. You will discover that Edom is often used as a symbol to represent the strong Gentile nations that were against God. Jacob was a symbol to represent God's chosen people. Therefore, how God dealt with Edom reflects the way he will deal with all those who are against him. Likewise, God will treat those who trust him the same way as he has treated Israel. All right, let me now introduce the general outline of the book of Obadiah. The introduction was found in verses 1 and 2. Verses 3 through 9 described the pride of Edom. Verses 10 through 14 listed the sins of the Edomites. Verses 15 and 16 described the downfall of Edom. Verses 17 through 20 prophesied the restoration of Israel. The conclusion of this book was given in verse 21. Wow, so much content was packed into only 21 verses. Now let us read the first two verses, Obadiah 1 and 2. Verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. This is what the Sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Let's go against her for battle. Verse 2. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. Right at the beginning, these verses tell us the author was Obadiah. Who is this person, Obadiah? These verses do not give any hint about him. You are right on this point. In fact, this book is rather unique on this point. Other books of prophecy always had a few words in the beginning to say about the prophet. However, some details have been given throughout this book that would allow us to give an educated guess as to when Obadiah had lived. In one of the accounts of the sins committed by the Edomites, it mentioned that the Edomites took advantage of the invasion of Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, by Babylon. It mentioned that the Edomites took advantage and plundered the city. This indicated that Obadiah had to be a prophet after the fall of Judah. Obadiah could very well be among the many captives taken to Babylon from Judah. Obadiah received the vision while he was in captivity. He prophesied against Edom as well as giving comfort to the captives. If this educated guess was correct, Obadiah must have completed his book within 10 years after the fall of Jerusalem, around 587 B.C. 
Pastor Zhang, the Jewish people are like the Chinese in that they pay great attention to the meaning of names. What does the word Obadiah mean? Obadiah means the servant of the Lord, or one who worships the Lord. Oh, the servant of the Lord, or one who worships the Lord. Terrific meaning. Well, those of you brothers who have not gotten an English name yet could consider using Obadiah. Okay, let us get back to the first two verses of the introduction. Prophet Obadiah pointed out first that the prophecy he spoke came from the Lord's vision, not from himself at all. Sister Joanne, have you noticed in what ways the Lord gave his vision to Obadiah? It was very animated. He first let Obadiah hear his message, and then he let him see a vision. The vision was that God was sending messengers to stir up the nations to attack Edom. But, Pastor Zhang, why did God stir up the nations to attack Edom? That was because of the haughtiness of Edom. Oh, Edom was just a little dot on the map. What was there to be proud of? Aha! Do not look down on its size. Let us go on and look at verses 3 through 9. You will then know why Edom was so proud. They had four reasons to be proud. Let us read verses 3 and 4 first. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights, you who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. In the times of Edom, the capital city was named Sila and not Petra. Edom was located in Seir, which is a high mountainous region. The landscape is treacherous and steep, especially for its capital city, Sila, which was built on a solid rocky mountain as high as 600 meters. The houses were built in the caves. It is indeed an impregnable fortress, difficult for anyone to attack. That is why the Edomites thought their city could never be overrun by anyone. The prophet compared the pride of the Edomites to that of an eagle soaring high above the sky, making its nest among the stars. Indeed, of all the birds, the eagle is the one that can fly the highest. Some eagles build their nests on the top of the tallest trees or on the highest mountain cliffs. Because of the height, no one can disturb the nests. The Edomites had the same mentality of an eagle, thinking that no one can ever attack their fortress. But they never thought that God would answer immediately and say, From there I will bring you down. Now let us look at the second reason. Let us read Obadiah verses 5 and 6. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you! Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. These verses give us a hint that the Edomites were very rich, with many precious stones stashed away, for which they were very proud. Pastor Zong, how could they get to be that rich? This has a lot to do with the geographic location of their city, Selah. There is only one path going from the desert mountain area into the city of Selah. It is a very narrow and treacherous road about one mile long in between the steep precipices on either side. If you lift up your head skyward, you can only see one narrow line. So even if you go through that path during the daytime, the path is very dim. Ah, so if you do not know the way, he would never have found it. Thus, the city became an ideal trading market and made a lot of money for the nation of Edom. They hid their treasures in their rocky chambers. But while they were gloating over their wealth, 
Obadiah the prophet told them that all the treasures would be taken away. Every Jewish person knew from the law that when they picked the grapes, they were to leave some behind for the poor, the orphans, and the widows to take home, lest they would have to beg for a living and lose their self-respect. However, the prophet said here that when others came and plundered the treasures of Edom, there would be nothing left behind. Now let us read verse 7 of Obadiah. All your allies will force you to the border, your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. Sister Joanne, what is this verse talking about? I think the verse is saying that Edom was deceived and was betrayed by her own allies. You are right. The third thing that made them proud was that they have many allies to depend on. These allies, who once ate at Edom's table, would later turn around and attack Edom. So they were not reliable after all. Pastor Zhang, what allies did Edom have at that time? Okay. Let us say that here was the Middle East back then, and Edom was located here. Arabia would be right here. Arabia used to be an ally of Edom, and a trading partner as well. But in the 5th century before Christ, Arabia drove off the Edomites. Ah, no wonder the prophet said the Edomites lacked wisdom. They treated their enemies as allies, and before they were aware of it, these allies drove them off their own land. Sister Joanne, do you know that the following two verses, 8 and 9, give us a hint as to what the fourth reason is? Oh... In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Your warriors, O Teman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. These two verses told us that Edom had many wise men, men of understanding, and warriors about whom they were very proud. Actually, at that time, there were other nations and people who had wise men. The latter part of Edom's era coincided with the period of the Zhao dynasty in China. Could you think of any wise men in China during that time? Um, I think of Confucius, Munches, Lao Tzu, etc. They were all wise men. Quite right. Now, beside the wise men, Edom also had warriors. Using today's language, we could say they are the military brass. No wonder Edom was that strong. But while they were so proud of their wisdom and strength, the prophet Obadiah told them that God would remove all their wise men, men of understanding, and all warriors. Now let us go on to Obadiah, verses 10 through 14, describing the sins of Edom. First, let us read verses 10 and 11. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. Here the phrase, your brother Jacob, implies Judah, with Jerusalem as its capital. Let us go over an incident that occurred when Jerusalem fell. Around 587 BC, when Jerusalem was overtaken by the Babylonians, Zedekiah, king of Judah, with a few of his military guards, tried to slip away at night to the valleys of River Jordan. However, King Zedekiah, forsaken by his soldiers, was captured in the plains of Jericho by the Babylonian armies. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, slaughtered all Zedekiah's sons in front of their father. He also gouged out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him to Babylon. Ah, oh, that is such a sad ending for Zedekiah. Some Bible scholars believed that the capture of Zedekiah's household was due to Edom abetting the enemy Babylon because the king was probably running in Edom's direction. Is that so? 
Considering the two peoples came from the same ancestry, Edom actually betrayed Judah, their own flesh and blood. Ah, oh, that was despicable. So here from verses 12 to 14, the prophet Obadiah listed eight sins committed by the Edomites in detail. Every word he used was poignant and powerfully convincing. Those words seem to have echoed from the very rocky precipices piercing into one's conscience. Let's try to do something different here. I will read the eight sins and you try to find a Chinese idiom to describe each sin. You should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune. Looking on with folded arms. Nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Taking delight in others' disasters. Nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. Putting salt on one's wound. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster. Abetting the enemy. Nor look down on them and their calamity in the day of their disaster. Offering no help in life or death situations. Nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. Looting after a fire. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives. Oh, preventing a person from surviving. Nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. Betraying brothers. But Pastor Zong, I have a question. The Israelites were not perfect either, so shouldn't they deserve to have some discipline? You just ask another good question. If you look through the history of Israel, you know that God never condones the sins committed by his chosen people. When they followed God's commandments, he would fight their battles. But when they were disobedient, especially when they chose to worship the idols instead of the one true God, God would chastise them. Do you know how God chastised his people? Mm, I think he may have chastised them by using the neighboring nations to attack and oppress them. Right. But these nations often went well overboard, taking delight in their oppression and abuse of the people of Israel. So God then would turn around and punish these Gentile nations. I understand what you mean. Edom was one of the nations God used to chastise Israel. But Edom went too far. I really do not want to falsely accuse Edom. So let us hear what God had to say through his servant, Amos. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because he pursued his brother with a sword, stifling all compassion, because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked. Edom used the sword to go after his brothers who were Jacob's descendants, the Israelites. So the Lord punished Edom because they were merciless with their killings, and their anger and fury lingered forever. In contrast, the Israelites obeyed God. They even had God's words put in writing. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7. Do not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. Pastor Zong, the sins of Edom were clearly indicated here. Reading this made me realize that God would not punish a nation or a person without having given sufficient and specific warnings. Only when a person ignores the warnings and refuses to repent, then God's judgment will come to him. You are right. Edom ignored the warnings by the prophet and refused to repent, and God's judgment fell on them. Now, let us look at verses 15 and 16 of Obadiah to hear God's final word on Edom. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. The Edomites later did disappear as if they had never been. How was this prophecy fulfilled? Let's look at history around the time of the demise of Edom. The presumption is that soon after the fall of Judah, around 587 BC, Edom was invaded by Babylon as well.
Then, around 325 BC, the Nabataeans, a people group from Arabia, occupied what was Edom and formed the nation of Nabataea and renamed the city Sela to Petra. Moreover, when Jerusalem was being invaded, the Edomites took advantage and occupied the southern part of Judah. Then in the year 539 BC, when the imperial nation of Persia was controlling Palestine, the area occupied by some of the Edomites became a special district and was renamed Idumea. When Christ was born, King Herod, who ordered the killing of male babies in Bethlehem, was from Idumea and was a descendant of Edom. In 70 AD, the Romans took Jerusalem. The Nabataeans revolted against the Romans and they got completely wiped out. Since then, the Edomites disappeared from the face of the earth. Sela, the old city that the Edomites were once so proud of, now lies in total ruins, where you cannot find any humans living there, but only wild animals roam about. This abandoned ancient city of which only tourists visit today is now referred to as the lost ancient city. Local artists today grind the colorful rocks into powders and fill them into glass bottles, arranging them into different patterns. See, that's how the prophecy regarding the nation of Edom was fulfilled. In contrast, Israel, cursed by the Edomites, has been restored with a bright future. Let's read verses 17 and 18. Yes, but on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. The house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau will be stubble, and they will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. Mount Zion is a small hill in the city of Jerusalem where King David once built the city of David. Therefore, Mount Zion here represents Jerusalem and the kingdom of David. But the writer was also looking ahead to the future of a new Jerusalem and Christ's coming kingdom. Sister Joanne, can you see some contrasts from these verses? Um, I see two sets of strong contrasts. The first one is that on Mount Zion there is deliverance, but there will be no survivors in the house of Esau. Has this prophecy come to pass? Yes. The Jewish people have gone through the worst sufferings among all nations in the world. Yet they have not been wiped out. God has kept a portion of them as a remnant of his people. Throughout history, Palestine has been under the rule of many nations, but Israel eventually did reestablish their nation. Soon after World War II, the Israeli flag was flying outside the United Nations building. 
On the other hand, our brief review of history showed that Edom had disappeared from the face of the earth. The other contrast is that the prophet said the Jews would be fire and flame, while the Edomites would be the stubble. When the stubble was burned with fire and flame, it would be destroyed. Is that right? Right. And besides these two contrasts, the prophet also said that the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. How huge is this inheritance? Let's read verses 19 and 20. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau, and people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the towns of the Negev. Now, let us look at these places on the map. Here are the mountains of Esau. Philistia is the hilly area along the coast in the middle of Palestine. Ephraim is north of Jerusalem. Samaria is in the central part of Palestine. Gilead is to the east of the River Jordan. And Zarephath is in the northwest of Palestine. This is a large coverage of land from Zarephath in the north to the mountains of Esau in the south. If you watch carefully the development of Israel today, you will see the unfolding of prophecy one step at a time. Finally, let us read verse 21 to hear the conclusion of the book of Obadiah. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. You notice that the word deliverers is plural, implying that God will raise several persons to come and deliver the Israelites. But it also points to one future deliverer. And who would the future deliverer be? It points to the great deliverer, Jesus Christ, who will come to judge all nations at the end of the age. Yes, we can say that the mountains of Esau would symbolize the kingdom of Satan. When Christ finally comes to judge, Satan would face the same ending as Edom, totally destroyed, and then, as the prophet said, the kingdom will be the Lord's. Sister Joanne, have you any reaction to the final words of this prophecy? Hmm. I feel he spoke powerfully, spectacularly, and filled with glory. If you were the prophet Obadiah, what tone of voice would you use for these words? I think I would shout with excitement. Hallelujah! The kingdom will be the Lord's. He is the king. That is wonderful. Can you imagine what it was like when Obadiah stood up in the midst of his countrymen while in captivity, in the midst of a hopeless situation with many hearts saddened and depressed? But it was at this time he delivered God's comforting words to his people. And mind you, the hope that God gave Obadiah was not just a small glimpse of hope, but God has led him to see his glorious and everlasting kingdom. I think God's perfect will was behind the discovery of this ancient city. It serves as a standing memorial reminding all those who pass by that every prophecy in the Bible will come to pass. Let us not give up hope during times of tribulation, but continue to trust God. Like the prophet Obadiah, let us look beyond our sufferings and see that glorious kingdom that awaits those who put their faith in Him. Brothers and sisters, I trust that the message from this book will strengthen your faith. Goodbye, Goodbye and, and may God, God bless you richly. You richly.